For reference, I'm a 27-year-old female. This story takes place 10 years ago, when I was 17. I had just started university and was excited about having a fresh, new start, since I'd always been a nerdy outcast in high school. I had never had a boyfriend before. I had never even been on a date. I was naive and optimistic about boys. My introverted and awkward personality hadn't magically changed since entering university, so it's safe to say I didn't meet any interesting guys at school. One late night, I was in my room working on an assignment on my laptop when I received a request on MSN Messenger. The email address was a boy's name with some numbers. The name was clearly ethnic and likely someone of the same origin as me. Intrigued, I accepted. We'll call this boy Ken. We got to chatting and I asked him how he'd gotten my email address. He dodged the question. I let it go, not thinking too much of it. This was from a time when it was normal to accept anyone and everyone as a friend on Facebook and other social media platforms. As Ken and I continued to talk, I learned that he lived in my city and apparently wasn't much older than me. As I'd guessed, our roots were in fact in the same country. I asked him why he didn't have a picture of himself on his display picture, and this prompted him to suggest that we turn on our webcams because he wanted to see me too. I declined, but he insisted. Somehow he convinced me, and we both switched on our webcams. I was pleasantly surprised and somewhat relieved to see that Kevin was a good-looking young guy, chatting to me from the comfort of his bedroom, seemingly very normal. Our MSN chats carried on for a couple of weeks. They developed into texts, and we'd even had a few phone calls, after I'd agreed to give him my number, of course. I started to develop a crush on Ken. He'd asked me to go out with him a couple of times, but I was always pretty busy with school, and our schedules weren't lining up. Finally, we did find one afternoon when we were both three, and we decided to schedule a lunch date. Ken had a car and offered to pick me up from my university after I was done for the day. I was a bit too dressed up for my C plus programming class, but just right for the lunch date we planned at a local vegetarian restaurant. Stupidly, I didn't tell any of my friends where I was going, or whom I'd be with, because I was embarrassed about going on my very first date, at almost the age of 18, with someone who had randomly added me on MSN. I waited outside my building when a black car with heavily tinted windows pulls up beside me. The passenger side window rolled down, and sure enough, there was Ken, sitting in the driver's seat. I was happy to see that he was as cute in person as he was on webcam. However, what I was not expecting was the intense smell of weed floating out of the car. Not relevant, but part of the first impression. Admittedly, I was a bit taken aback and was concerned that he might be driving high. He unlocked the doors and motioned for me to get in, so I did without dispute. As I sat down in the passenger seat, he immediately put his hand on my thigh. I nervously shifted my leg away. So, I started. Do you know where the restaurant is? I can guide you if you want. He smirked at me, but didn't say anything. He just started driving. Okay. Kind of weird, I thought. Maybe he was just nervous or awkward, both of which I can sympathize with, so I let it be. I was about to try my hand at small talk, which I'm no good at, when I noticed him heading towards the highway ramp. I started to worry because the restaurant was not far from my campus, and there was no reason for us to be getting the highway. You don't need to take the highway. The restaurant is really close by. I can guide you. I tried to keep my voice steady, but I could hear my own nervousness. Ken finally spoke, for the first time since I'd gotten into that car. I thought maybe we could just go by my place instead. We can play Need for Speed and I can make lunch for you. I was 17, on my way to the house of a guy I'd just met for the first time, and I hadn't told anyone where I was going. My mind was racing. I knew this would be an utterly stupid thing to do despite the clear red flags waving in my face. I decided that I didn't want to ruin our first date by rejecting his offer to make me lunch and play Need for Speed together, which I told him I liked playing. So, like an idiot, I reluctantly agreed to avoid being rude. We made it to his house, and it was apparently his family's home. It was situated in a sort of shady neighborhood. 
We stepped inside and, of course, no one was home except us. It was sparsely furnished and looked unkempt, which struck me as pretty odd for a family home. He informed me that his Xbox was in his bedroom. I hesitated in the doorway, but he sat at the foot of his bed in front of the TV and padded the empty space beside him for me to have a seat. There was literally nowhere else to sit in his room, so I cautiously sat down, keeping as much distance as I could between us. I started to relax as we played Need for Speed, and he made us a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to munch on. I was about to laugh at myself for being overly paranoid, when Ken did something bizarre, he got up onto the bed and sat down directly behind me, his legs on either side of me. He tried to guide my hands on the controller. I started to ask him what he was doing, and as if this wasn't uncomfortable enough, his hands moved from the controller and slid up onto my shirt. That's when I really started to panic. I thought he was trying to touch my chest, but instead, he started squeezing and massaging my belly. I was more than a little chubby back then, so you can't imagine what it might have been like. I dropped the controller in pure shock and quickly stood up, fixing my shirt. I was at a loss for words and he did nothing but smirk at me and tell me that he liked it. I felt completely disgusted and violated. I had had enough. I lied to him and told him that I had a group project to work on and needed to go. He asked where I lived so he can drop me off. Thankfully, I had the common sense not to tell him. I asked him to drop me back off at school instead. That was where I was supposedly meeting my classmates. He obliged. After our very uncomfortable first date, I decided I didn't want to talk to Ken anymore. I didn't block him on MSN or my phone. Our only two methods of communication, but I rarely responded to his messages and I ignored all of his calls. Once, he messaged me on MSN at around 11 p.m asking me to come over and telling me he would send a cab to bring me over to his place. Thoroughly annoyed, I responded, What do you take me for? Why do you even think I would want to do that? He replied, saying, No sex, I promise. I was bizarre. I was disgusted and didn't even respond. He continued trying to get in touch with me for months, and then suddenly vanished. I'd figured he'd finally gotten the point. No. I wish the story ended here, but it doesn't. I last heard from Ken in late February. He had stopped trying to contact me shortly after Valentine's Day. In April, two nuclear family members and I went on holiday to visit another relative. We'll call her Anne, and she was living in the Caribbean at the time. Anne, whom I love dearly, was, and still is, a bit of an eccentric. She considers herself very spiritual, and is an active member of a large, well-known spiritual organization. She is deeply connected with the country of my roots, and goes back for frequent visits. While we stayed with her in the Caribbean, she told us about her most recent spiritual trip back home, where she met a wealthy and well-connected local woman through the organization. They quickly became very close friends. We'll call her Connie, the con artist. During our visit, Anne introduced us to Connie virtually over Skype. We chatted with her a couple of times throughout our vacation and got to know her a bit. Little did we know back then that Connie, who Anne had spontaneously met halfway across the world, would soon wreak utter havoc on our lives. Now that's a story that I'm just not and may never be ready to tell because of how many lives were affected and the severity of the damage that had been inflicted. What you need to know is that Connie was an outright criminal and con artist. She'd been targeting our family from long before Anne had actually met her. Their meeting was no coincidence. Not only did she manage to steal over a hundred thousand from our family, but she took away any peace of mind or sense of security we ever had. When we finally caught on and confronted her, she insisted that we were mistaken, but she disappeared into thin air once we forced her out of our lives. You are probably wondering what on earth this has to do with my story about Ken. Well, get this. The situation with Connie lasted many months. The whole thing is kind of a blur to me now, but we first spoke to her online in April, and I remember the whole ordeal lasting well into the fall. While she normally resided in the country of my roots, Anne had invited her to visit and stay with us where we presently live. That's when things really took a turn for the worse. Some of the things I clearly remember and are important to the story are. 
Number one, the whole time she was staying with us, she was trying to convince me to transfer schools to a very obscure school program in the US. She was actually getting very pushy about it. And number two, she had asked me if I was a virgin and told me to save myself for my husband. Disturbing, I know. During this time, I was so emotionally drained and stressed that I really didn't think anything of it. In fact, I had stopped socializing almost entirely and even started habitually skipping classes. I had lost contact with my high school friends and my university friends were too new to really care. So my strange behavior and new destructive habits went unnoticed. Fast forward to one day, after Connie's final disappearance in the fall, I was at home with my dad when my cell phone rang. I looked at the caller ID and it was a number I didn't have saved, so it was showing the contact information as whatever name the phone was registered under. My heart dropped into my stomach. My phone displayed a name. The first name was a man's name and the last name was the same as Connie's. I started to panic and ran into my bedroom to answer the call. I had no idea what to expect. When I picked up the phone, I was greeted by a familiar voice. It was Ken. I honestly thought I was going to puke when I came to the sudden realization that he had been a part of this whole sick plot. Of course, I don't have hard evidence to prove he was connected to Connie, but let me explain. The timing of his appearance and reappearance into my life, the last name, which was a very unique one, and it originated from where Connie was from, and also the fact he contacted me out of the blue. I had no idea why or how. It's all just too bizarre to be a mere coincidence. Of course, I freaked out at Ken when he called. I told him to never call me again, and I told him I would call the police. His response was just a weird, dry half laugh. And then he said, Well, okay then, in the most creepy voice you can think of, and hung up. I knew in my gut that this was their last attempt to get back in touch trying to slither their way back into my family's lives. Thankfully, I never heard from Ken again after that day. A while after this all ended, I was having a conversation with a family member. We were talking about the whole ordeal, and she told me she sent something extremely wrong when Connie was pushing to have me sent off to the US, to that obscure school. She had an unshakable feeling that Connie was involved in some sort of human trafficking scene, and that if I left, she never would have seen me again. The horrifying pieces came together for me at that time. I was just too damn naive to have seen it before. The memories flooded back to me when I heard that. How Ken had told me, no sex, I promise, when he invited me over, and how Connie was telling me to remain a virgin. As I said, I had never told a soul about Ken, nor about the weird V-card conversation with Connie. I strongly and firmly believe that Ken had been some sort of player in Connie's game, that he was just there to keep me away from guys and prevent me from having a boyfriend. For those who may be wondering, we never called the police on Connie or Ken because nothing illegal happened at face value. It's very hard to explain. I'll also mention that I tried to find Ken online many times after this all ended. I wasn't even able to find a sliver of information on him, not by the name Ken nor by the name on the caller ID. It was as if he didn't exist. I'm also awful at directions and didn't even remember his address or where his house was exactly. I hope this can serve as a warning to young people to never trust anyone, to do your thorough checks on people, especially those you meet online, and to be very aware and wary of people's intentions. Stay safe, everyone. And to Ken and Connie, rot in hell. This happened years ago, but still affects me to this day. The summer after I graduated high school, I was still living at home. I was up late one night and was packing for a camping trip with my friends. It was unbelievably hot and I had the window open as I sat in folded clothes. It was around 2 in the morning and the next thing I knew, there was a hand coming through the gap in the screen of my window. I screamed and the hand flew back out. I was stunned. But there was a part of me that wondered if it was my younger brother pranking me. I got up and looked out the window and just saw the figure of a man staring back at me. 
I ran into my brother's bedroom and he was there playing video games. We called the police who came and searched the area. They didn't find anything. They warned my parents and I to lock the doors and windows and left. We were all still shaken up and my mom had a feeling he would come back. It turns out her mother's intuition was right. She went outside and waited on our back porch. After 20 minutes or so, she saw a man, dressed in black, slink into our backyard along the tree line, slowly working his way towards my window. My mother yelled something to him and he took off running. The police came back out and again, they found no trace of him. I never opened that window again, not even the curtains. My parents installed some motion detecting lights and that seemed to be the end of that. About six months later, my friend and I got an apartment downtown together. We were really excited as this was our first place on our own. The apartment wasn't exactly the best quality, but it was so fun to be living in the city. The downside was that it was street parking only, and after a few weeks, my car was broken into. Nothing was taken, but a single row sat on the passenger seat. It was creepy, but I vowed to be vigilant and safe. I always tried to park close to the entrance, near the lights, but often it was difficult to get close to those spots. I would often have to park farther away on darker streets. Things quickly began escalating at this point. My car was broken into at least once a week. Most of the time a flower was left, but once a pair of men's underwear was left, and even more creepily, once a bag of Tootsie Rolls as they were my favorite candy. This made me wonder if the person knew me personally and I started to become suspicious of everyone. There was a laundry area in the basement of the apartment. One day I went down to get a load that finished drying. As I started to fold, I realized all of my undergarments, bras and panties, were all gone. Another week I had a male friend over from school. His tires got slashed during the visit. By the time the first letter arrived, I had already started making plans to move elsewhere. The letter described a love for me that had been going on for years. The person noted things that proved he'd been watching me closely. I was able to arrange for another friend to take over my lease. I moved in with another friend on the other side of the city. It was a secured building and had an underground parking garage that was only accessible to tenants. I felt much more secure and the extra money spent was well worth the peace of mind. Things were quiet for a few months and then my roommate got a boyfriend. Most of us were wary of Ashley's new boyfriend from the beginning. For one, they met on MySpace after he reached out to her. Another reason was that the new boyfriend, Matt, was extremely good looking. And while Ashley was a wonderful person, she just wasn't the type you would typically expect someone like him to date. Ashley was thrilled. She never had a boyfriend and really felt like he was her Prince Charming. And I thought he was weird and creepy from the beginning. Matt was on the quiet side and always seemed to be sporting an uncomfortable, leering smile. It was difficult to carry on any sort of conversation with him because he would always make it weird with some random facts that were completely unrelated to what we were talking about. I had to delete my MySpace when the initial stalking began, but I did create a dummy account to learn more about Matt. It didn't look like he really knew any of his friends in real life. There were only pictures of himself and the rest of the information was vague. My friends and I gently tried to discourage her from seeing Matt. He technically hadn't done anything wrong, but he was just so strange. She would immediately get defensive and would shut the conversation down. Matt started to spend more time at the apartment, and I found myself finding any excuse I could to avoid coming home. One day I came home from work and found Matt on the couch, alone, drinking a beer. Ashley had been called into work and she told him he could just hang out. I was furious because I didn't want to spend any time with him, so I grabbed a beer and a snack and headed off to my room and shut the door. About 30 minutes or so, he knocked on my door and suggested we watch some TV and get to know each other better because we both loved Ashley. I did not want to, but I decided that maybe I needed to give it a try. He put on a movie and I tried to just focus on it because I didn't want to talk. At one point, I glanced over to Matt. He was staring at me with a smile on his face. I snapped a what at him. He just continued smiling and said, I just can't believe it. Believe what? I asked. He said nothing and went back to watching the movie. 
still smiling. I had no idea what he was talking about, but the interaction had every hair standing up on my body. I excused myself and locked the door to my room. Another month or so went on, and I had managed to avoid being home for much beyond sleep and showering. Matt practically lived there. He even brought a bunch of his things into Ashley's room. I really didn't want to move again, but I was beginning to look for other options. On their six-month anniversary, I saw a huge bouquet of flowers on the table and an already open card propped up next to it. I rolled my eyes and was about to leave when I decided to see what that weirdo wrote to her. When I opened the card, my heart started beating through my chest. Without even reading the words he wrote, I was shaking. The handwriting was exactly the same as the note my stalker left me in my car. I had kept them as evidence and dug them out of my desk for comparison. The handwriting was unique and identical. Matt was the stalker. I called the police first. As they were on their way, I called Ashley and asked her to come over. She was at work but said she would be there when she could. I was terrified to tell her because I knew she would be shattered. The police took a statement from me and actually went to Ashley's work to get more information about her. They ended up breaking the news. Apparently Ashley called Matt and left a furious message, even though the cops told her not to say anything. He completely disappeared after that. There was no Matt or anyone matching his resemblance at the place he said he worked. Ashley had never been to his apartment because he said he'd been staying with friends while trying to save money for a trip to Europe. His family lived out of state and she had never met a friend of his because he said they had a falling out because he was choosing to spend so much time with Ashley. It was all lies and in the end, she was dating a stranger. We don't even know if Matt was his real name. The cherry on top of this whole thing was when we went through Matt's things. He had left everything when he disappeared. Ashley and I decided to go through everything. There was a duffel bag that was full of gym clothes. But in one of the compartments, there were about ten pictures of me. All were taken from far away, with the exception of one, which was of me sleeping. The sheets were current, so I know it had to have been taken at the current apartment before I started locking my bedroom door. A few pictures dated back before the incident at my parents' house, which made us think that was him as well. Two pairs of my missing underwear were there, and I shuddered to think what he did with the rest. There was a Starbucks lid with my red lipstick marks, a necklace I hadn't even noticed missing, and a few other random sick souvenirs. The police never tracked him down. I decided to accept an opportunity overseas that I'd been considering, I got the hell out of there. Unfortunately, Ashley and I quickly drifted apart. She had a really hard time accepting that her first love was a complete psycho. I think I had some underlying anger for believing all of his lies and letting him into our lives. I don't know what his endgame was. Would he have tried to hurt me? Or was he simply content with being in my world? I'll never know. Being stuck changes you, even when I lived across the world. I looked over my shoulder everywhere I went. I still have no social media accounts attached to my real name. I am married with children and know that he moved on to torment some other poor woman. But every time I visit my hometown, I am tense and keep a low profile. Part of me will always worry that Matt will resurface again. I'm a 25 year old female, and for some backstory, when I was about 15, I met this guy who would eventually become one of my best friends. We'll call him Dave. Dave and I had lots of mutual friends, so we saw each other a lot. Now, Dave is a gay man, but when we first met, he was so deep in the closet he could find Narnia. When I was 16, one of our mutual friends threw a Halloween party. Dave brought the guy who would eventually become my long term boyfriend. We'll call him Alan. Him and Alan met in their sophomore year of high school and have been best friends ever since. Alan knew Dave was gay since the day they've met. I knew Dave was gay because of the stuff he was looking at on the internet. Yet it took another year and a half after Alan and I started dating for him to come out of the closet. We were happy he finally felt comfortable enough to come out. Not long after, that's when Dave met his first boyfriend. And that's where our story begins. 
I believe that Dave met this guy while on a camping trip. Well, this guy who we'll be calling Jimmy was a few years older than us, about 25 at the time. Dave and Alan were both 20 and I was 18. I had just graduated high school. The entire story takes place from May to July 2012. Dave and Jimmy had only been dating like two weeks before I got to meet him. Dave drove up to my parents' condo with Jimmy in the car to pick me up. We were going to have lunch together. Well, I wasn't ready yet, so I told them to come upstairs for a minute while I finished my makeup. Dave had been there plenty of times and knew which unit was my parents. They come in, I finish my makeup, and about ten minutes later we're off. Now lunch was good and Jimmy seemed nice. After lunch, Dave drops me back off home because I had somewhere else to be in the morning. I didn't want to be out late. About two hours later, I'm in my room watching TV with my dog, when my mom pops her head in and asks if I know a guy named Jimmy. Turns out, Jimmy was at the front door asking for me. David dropped him off at the library, which was about two blocks away from my house, because he wanted to check Facebook while Dave went and ran some errands. He'd gotten bored of that and walked to my house to see if I wanted to hang out. My mom lets him in and we went to my room. He then proceeds to lay across my bed like it's his and talks to me. So much for my TV show. I text Dave and tell him where Jimmy is that he should come and get him because I have things to do tomorrow. I need to be asleep at a good time. It takes Dave about 45 minutes to show up, and during that time, Jimmy is laying across my bed asking me about myself. No red flags are going off at this point because I'm just annoyed. I was enjoying my evening watching TV. Eventually, Dave shows up, but before Jimmy leaves, he asks for my cell phone number. I give it to him and he leaves. The next few days go by uneventful, but then I get a message from Jimmy. He states that he thinks I'm really cool and wants to hang out with me. I tell him that me and Alan hang out a lot with Dave, so he'll probably see a lot of me. He then states that he would like to hang out with it just being the two of us. He said, I would prefer us to hang out alone sometime, so we can get to know each other more. Now this is when red flags started to go off. He keeps getting more and more pushy, and eventually when I message one of my friends and tell her about what's going on, she then comes over and reads the messages. She starts sending him random shit from my phone to get him to leave me alone, which did work, but only for a while. Now I'm not sure how this happened, but Jimmy had lost his place to live and needed somewhere to go, so he moved in with Alan and his roommate at the time. Dave still lived at home, and he couldn't come out to his parents yet, so Jimmy couldn't move in with him. It's a small two-bedroom apartment, but they managed to fit a full second-size mattress into Alan's room on the floor. And that's where Jimmy slept. Except Dave was constantly over there, so it was Alan, Jimmy, and Dave, all sleeping in one room. Now his room was always occupied by Jimmy and Dave, so me and Alan never got much time to be alone together. Which was fine, they made good company, until Dave wasn't around. Jimmy was an absolute horrible roommate. He never cleaned up after himself, never contributed to food in the fridge. He didn't even have a car, so Dave drove him everywhere. It was a good thing that Alan's roommate was never home and didn't give two shits as long as nobody entered his room, and that rent was paid on time. However, me and Alan were getting tired of his shit, but we put up with him because we both cared about Dave, and Dave was in love with this guy. After the whole text thing, I tried to ignore Jimmy, but every chance he got, he tried to talk to me. I tried to ignore it as politely as I could. I never did tell Dave or Alan about the texts. I didn't want to start drama. He would flirt with me and give me hugs that were too long, put his hands on my shoulders or legs while sitting down. I usually pushed him off and moved away from him. Not long after this started, he started asking me things like, How long have you and Alan been together? He seems kind of like an asshole. Are you happy with him? That made me more uncomfortable. Alan and I don't do public displays of affection because we think it's unnecessary and he treats me like a human being instead of a damn flower. So he's not up my ass holding me every chance he gets. But then Jimmy took it a step too far. This was a few weeks after Jimmy moved in. I was sleeping in Alan's bed. We had finally gotten some alone time that afternoon. We did what most hormonal young adults do. Afterwards I was tired and wanted a nap. So I put on a tank top and my underwear and curled up under the blankets. Alan decided to let me sleep for a while, 
and afternoon turned into evening, and now Jimmy was there. Alan was in the living room with his roommate. Jimmy decided it would be a good idea to spend some of that alone time with me while I was sleeping in my underwear. Now I had felt a warm body pressed up against my back. I was still out of it and figured it was Alan. A while later, I heard aloud, What the fuck are you doing? And then I woke up. It wasn't Alan spooning me as I slept. It was Jimmy. He had taken off his shirt, lifted the blankets, and crawled into Alan's bed and cuddled with me while I was asleep. Alan was furious. Jimmy insisted that it was harmless and he wasn't doing anything wrong. I was mortified and creeped out beyond belief. Afterwards, I came forward to Alan and showed him the texts. When he told Dave about it, Dave refused to believe that Jimmy would do something like this. Then I started getting texts from Jimmy again. He said he was sorry if I took his actions the wrong way. He sent me something like, You remind me of someone, like a girlfriend from a past life. I just want to be closer to you. After this, Jimmy got kicked out of the apartment. Dave was pissed at us, but Alan refused to put up the shit anymore. Dave and Jimmy dated for about another month. After they broke up, he apologized to us. And now he doesn't talk about him except to call him a piece of shit. Me and Alan are still together to this day, and we're both still close to Dave. So close to the point his mother invites us over to family functions. Dave has moved on, came out to his parents, and has had a wonderful boyfriend for the last four years. This one also has never tried to spoon me. I had forgotten about all of this until last year when I went to Walmart with my dad one day. We were there to get something but we had wanted to check on the price of ammo for his 9mm. Turns out, Jimmy now works in the sporting goods section at the local Walmart. He tried to make eye contact with me while he checked the prices of ammo for my dad. After leaving, my dad mentioned how he noticed the guy kept looking at me. I just called him a creep and left it at that. I've never been more thankful to leave a Walmart. So I've been on Grinder for about 10 years, and I've had plenty of fucked up experiences. This one in particular reminds me of when I was at a party without my car, and my phone was on 10%. But a decently hot Grinder guy said he would pick me up, that we could hang at his place before he drove me home. So of course I jumped on the opportunity. Anyway, we got to his place and he got me pretty drunk, but he never tried to make a move. I assumed he was going to wait and just convince me to stay the night later. Finally, my phone died like after two hours. I didn't even have to say anything before he noticed it was dead. He then stood up and said, Well, let's go to the car then. When I asked if he had a charger I could use, he just said no. After we got in the car, he got kind of quiet and less flirty. I spaced out, enjoying his music and looking out the window. I didn't even notice that he never asked me where I lived until I realized we'd been driving for over an hour, not even towards my town, but into the canyons. I asked where he was going and he just said, I thought we could just go for a drive. And my drunk ass was like, okay. So anyway, to make a long story shorter, he ended up taking us four or five miles down a dirt road with no signs or houses, until it dead-ended into this cabin with no lights or cars outside. He parked and then turned the car off. That's when the dread started to creep in as I sobered up. I said I drank too much and should probably head home, but he didn't even respond. He just sat there, staring at the cabin, and he said, You said you like being kinky. You're pretty submissive, correct? I responded, Uh, sure, but I just meant like, normal rough kind of shit, nothing wild. He started sounding a little annoyed and his sentences seemed a little less carefully worded, kind of like he was just spitting out the bare minimum of each thought. He said something about how some of his favorite people are those who can find pleasure in pain. If someone goes into shock enough times, eventually it becomes like a drug and they crave more. Then something about how pushing a person into the deep end is the fastest way to teach them how to swim. At that point I was scared enough to assert myself and firmly said, Okay, well that sounds fun and all, but just not tonight. I just want to go home now. This place is creepy. He just sighed and gripped his keys tighter. 
Then right as I glanced at his phone sitting in the cup holder, right before it occurred to me to grab it, he snatched it up so fast and held it in his left hand, kind of behind his head to make it clear he wasn't going to let me near it. I made this kind of, what? sound, and he just gave me this almost, I'm proud of you son, half smile like dads do when they pat you on the shoulder or something. And it was quiet and he kept looking me up and down for a minute or so. Then he got a little more gruff and said, Let's go inside. I have these friends you'll really like once you meet them. You'll feel a lot better. Or something to that extent. But he wasn't even trying to sound genuine or comforting. Like he'd been doing so well earlier in the night. Finally I lied and spoke up a bit and told him. I told my roommates and my friend I was meeting up with you before you picked me up. And I sent screenshots of your face and some of the conversation. They're going to freak out if I don't charge my phone and reply to them in the next few hours. I tried not to make it sound accusatory, more like I was just worried about my friends going crazy, but it was clear he knew what I was implying. At that point he let out an exasperated grunty sigh. He started the car and we drove away. Driving back, I got nervous about him stalking me and coming after me in the future, so I tried to apologize and tell him I'd be down to hang out another time maybe. But tonight just wasn't great for me. Blah, blah, blah. He didn't say a single word the whole drive back. Didn't ask where I lived. But he dropped me off at the McDonald's about 40 miles away from my apartment. When I was stepping out of the car, he suddenly leaned over and gave me a hard shove. I almost fell out the rest of the way. He grabbed my backpack off the floor and flung it out of his window across the parking lot. He peeled out with the passenger door still open. He broke my laptop and cracked my phone. I had to ask a stranger to use her charger and call an Uber, but at that point I was just so anxious to get home I didn't give a shit. What's so weird is how, while this was happening, even though I was terrified, I guess I wasn't thinking about exactly what he was planning on doing with me. I just knew I needed to get away. So it wasn't until I got home and got in the shower that I realized how messed up the situation was and what might have happened if I let him walk me into the cabin and all that stuff. I just remember being so shaken and smacked by the reality of it. It almost felt like a panic attack, so I sat down in the shower with my head between my knees. I cried till it ran cold and got out. I woke my roommate up to tell him about it, and he kind of calmed me down. So while I still have a grinder account, I just use it as an ego boost. I'm reluctant to meet up with anyone from it now. Anyway, girls and gays, I suppose the moral of the story is that we gotta be careful out there. This happened in 2011. I'd just gotten out of a rough relationship a few months prior to this happening. My friends encouraged me to try dating again, so I caved and made a profile on the website Plenty of Fish. I was very surprised with how many messages I'd received within the first few hours. Most were just people saying hi or asking to hook up. I wasn't looking for a hookup, so I ignored those messages. After about a week, a guy roughly an hour away from me messaged me. He was cute, so I messaged him back. The conversation was pretty casual at first. He asked if I'd like to go for a coffee sometime, and not thinking anything of it, I said sure. This is where it started to get weird. He started to get pushy and ask when we could grab a coffee. I told him I didn't have my own car, so I'd have to borrow my mom's car to meet up with him. He offered to come pick me up, but I wasn't comfortable with that idea. The next message made my blood run cold. It read, I'm sure your hometown isn't that big. If I knocked on a few doors, someone would be able to tell me where you lived. Are you crazy, I replied. I'm sorry, but that's kind of creepy. This just pissed him off. He messaged me a couple of times after this, saying, You know I have a big gun. I could shoot you and make you disappear. No one would look for you. You're nothing but a dirty slut. I could kill you. I'll throw you down a well and no one will ever find you. I was really scared at this point, so I asked him to please leave me alone. He replied with the following, I know where your hometown is. It's not a big town. I can find you. At this point I had enough and blocked him. 
I reported his account to Plenty of Fish and deleted my account. I was really on edge for the next few weeks after the fact. I was afraid he was actually going to come look for me. This took place a couple of years ago, but believe me when I tell you it's still relevant. A year ago, I met a guy at a bar. He called himself Joy. I wasn't looking for anything serious, and apparently, neither was he. We got along great and started hooking up until things started to get weird. He began being more intimate, telling me about his life, and specifically about his ex-girlfriend that killed herself not even a year ago. I honestly felt bad for him and tried to comfort him telling him it wasn't his fault and stuff. At some point, I don't really know when, we became exclusive. We weren't a proper couple, but we decided not to sleep with anyone else. Or so I thought. I found out he'd been seeing other women, and honestly, I was pissed. For me, honesty is a very important thing. He seemed to be toying around with me. I set my mind and ended it with him, to which he didn't seem to care. Now I was kind of sad and angry at myself since I felt played with, and I should have known better. That didn't last long though since he kept texting me like usual, asking me to hang out as normal. I told him I wasn't interested, and that I honestly didn't want to waste my time anymore. Then things got creepy. He accused me of seeing someone else, said I was dishonest, and even called me names like slut and that kind of thing. I wouldn't have it. I told him he was mental and he should stay away from me. He threatened to end himself. At this point, it was beyond clear to me that he was either on drugs or mentally unbalanced. Either way, and because I have a history with suicide, I was really triggered by that. The thought of someone I know dying and me not doing anything about it wouldn't let me sleep, even if it was just blackmail. So I text one of his friends and tell him to just check on him. A couple of days passed and he called me saying he was sorry that it had been a rough couple of weeks for him and that he really wanted to see me just to talk. I naively accepted. We decided to meet up at a bar we used to go to and we mostly sat in silence. I was still kind of hurt and in no way was I planning to get back with him. I guess I just wanted to know he was okay. The few words we exchanged were to order some drinks and some fries. It was almost as if he was ignoring me and I got tired pretty quick. I finished my beer, left my part of the money on the table, and told him to have a good life. As I was leaving, even more pissed than before, I heard someone running behind me. Tired, I turned to face someone who was probably him, and felt a cold shiver down my spine when I saw the look on his face. It was honestly like he was possessed. He caught up to me and shoved me to the wall with his hand on my throat. You are not going to leave me like that, he yelled squeezing his hand. Now never in my life had I been in a situation like this before, so the fear paralyzed me. But bless the waiter who ran after this maniac because he didn't pay the rest of his bill. I guess he had some experience with troublemakers, because in a few seconds he had him locked down under his arm. I rested against the wall, crying and coughing, while the waiter called for help. I thanked him, but left for home immediately. I only told my best friend what had happened and my fear turned to anger. I wanted to rip that guy apart, but I'm smarter than that. I'm 160 centimeters, and I didn't exactly exercise in any way. If someone was going to be ripped apart, it was me. So I let it pass, under the condition that if he contacted me again, I would find a way to end him. He never contacted me again. So why am I telling this story now, you ask? Well, about two months ago I saw it. Not in person, but on TV. He's being accused of the murders of three girls who were his girlfriends at the time. He's being classified as a serial killer. And the year where he was inactive, between the last kill and the second to last, was the year we went out. Why didn't I report it to the police? Well, I tried. However, they told me I was useless since I hadn't seen him in years. I'm not afraid anymore, but I am sad. I'm sad thousands of women, especially in my country, get killed every year and very few people take the time to find those responsible. Dear Joy, I'm not the insecure, weak girl I was back then. 
For your sake, let's not meet again. This took place 20 years ago when I was 12 years old. Almost all of the details were kept from me at the time due to my age, so I didn't find out until much later what actually took place. My mother, understandably, still doesn't really like talking about any of this, as it was a really traumatic experience. It's only with hindsight that I've realized how genuinely creepy and horrific this whole situation was. In early 2000, I had just started high school, we lived a little way from school, so my mother used to drop me off in the mornings and pick me up in the afternoons. On the 15th of February that year, I headed to meet my mom at the usual pickup point across the road from my school, but I was surprised to find my grandmother waiting for me there instead. My grandmother told me that my mom wasn't able to pick me up, so I went with her and we picked up my brother from his primary school. We went back to our grandparents' house and my nana and grandfather sat us down to tell us that something terrible had happened. Our mom's closest friend, Vivian, had died the previous day. They didn't go into any detail other than my mom was extremely upset. We were upset too. Vivian was a lovely lady and we'd spent a lot of time at her house over the years. It wasn't only because my mom and Vivian were close, but also because Vivian's husband, Andrew, was my brother's Cub Scout leader and one of their sons was my brother's friend. At that age, nobody I knew had ever died so it was quite difficult to process what had happened. We'd only just seen her the previous week. From my perspective as a naive 12-year-old, the following days passed mostly without incident, apart from my mother's obvious sadness. In hindsight, there was also an air of disquiet around her, but I didn't really clock it at the time. Around two weeks after Vivian's death, I was at home with my mother and brother while my stepfather was out for dinner with a client. It was early evening, perhaps 7 p.m., I believe my older sister was at her boyfriend's house, while my younger sister was at basketball practice. Our house had a large, open-plan L-shaped room which encompassed the kitchen, living room, and dining room areas. My brother was playing in his bedroom while I was sitting on the couch watching TV in the living room area with my mom. From that vantage point, I had a clear view of the front door. The security light on our front porch flickered on, and then there was a knock at the door. My mother got up to answer it, and as she opened the door, she took a step backwards and visibly stiffened. It was Vivian's husband, Andrew. He was standing on our porch, asking to see my stepfather. I remember my mom explaining that my stepdad wasn't available to talk at the moment, and that if Andrew needed to speak to him, then it would be better to leave a message. Andrew clearly realized my stepdad wasn't home and insisted on waiting for him. My mom repeated that it would be better to call another time, but he easily sidestepped her into the house and strode into the living room area. I can still picture my mother's forced cheeriness and frozen smile as he sat down on the couch opposite mine. He asked for a cup of tea while he waited. Mom, still with a strange smile plastered to her face, asked me to make the tea while she told V's husband that she'd call to find out what time my stepdad would be home. I made tea for all three of us and sat back down on the couch making awkward small talk with him while my mom repeatedly dialed my stepdad's mobile number. He wasn't answering. Andrew was talking to me, but I remember thinking it was rude that he didn't seem to be paying much attention to what I was saying. His eyes were constantly flickering over to my mom, who was standing at the phone in the kitchen area around five meters away from us. The whole thing felt very weird to me. She eventually got through to my stepdad and, still smiling, said something along the lines of, Darling, Andrew is here. Yes, here, in the living room. Yes. Yes. He said he's waiting for you. You won't be long, will you? My stepdad was home within 20 minutes and convinced Andrew to leave, with the promises they could speak on the phone the following day. I found out years later that my mother, stepfather, and the rest of their friends, along with Vivian's parents and brother, all strongly suspected that Andrew had murdered Vivian. My siblings and I didn't attend the funeral, but I later discovered that a police presence was needed at Vivian's funeral. Vivian's brothers were so angry that there were concerns they may assault Andrew, as they were convinced he had murdered her. That's how intensely people suspected him. My mom was utterly terrified when he showed up at our door that night, 
but she had been desperately trying both not to antagonize him, nor to frighten me. It transpired that he had been interviewed by the police earlier that day, and it was clear they were building a case against him. He wanted legal advice and potential representation from my stepfather, who, may I add, refused. According to my mom, Vivian and Andrew had been having marital problems for a long time. Vivian had confided in my mom that she had felt increasingly uncomfortable around him, that his temper could be frightening for both her and their children. They were already sleeping in separate bedrooms, but he didn't seem to be accepting that the marriage was all but over. The previous weekend, she had told my mom and others that she was planning to officially leave him. She was going to be making it clear to him that it was over too. She was bludgeoned to death with a steel rod in her bedroom on Valentine's Day. She had just returned home from dropping her boys off at school, having supposedly interrupted a burglary, though the police immediately realized that this was obviously staged. The contents of the drawers from the bedside tables and chest of drawers had been emptied out into piles on the floor, but there was no indication that these piles had been sifted through. There were no signs of forced entry and nothing was stolen. My mom believes that she had potentially rejected some form of romantic gesture, and he snapped. However, there was blood on the piles of drawer contents, yet no blood on the floor underneath. That suggests that the burglary may have been staged before she even returned home that morning. Andrew tried to cover up his crime by deliberately driving to a series of shops and obtaining receipts for small purchases and making inquiries with cashiers, all to build an alibi. He also originally claimed that he had visited a large shopping mall on the day of the murder, that he walked around there for quite some time. But two weeks later, he changed his story. He said he'd actually been at a very popular local nature reserve, walking around and reading a book. Conveniently, there is no CCTV in any part of that nature reserve, and that includes the car park. He wasn't seen by any of the walkers in the area. He had come to our house that evening after admitting earlier that day that he had initially lied about his whereabouts to the police. He was arrested soon after. Andrew has never admitted to the murder and was found guilty on circumstantial evidence. He was sentenced to 21 years with a minimum term of 16 years, meaning he may already be out on parole. I can't find any information about that online, however, and I don't want to ask my mom about it as I don't want to drag up any awful memories for her. Oh, and a few years later, Andrew also went through the phase of writing letters to my younger brother from prison, protesting his innocence. My brother would have been around 11 to 12 years old at that stage. It was all just creepy. So in November of 2016, I went through a pretty bad breakup. In October of 2017, I finally felt comfortable enough to try to get back into the dating world. So like a moron, I got on Tinder. It wasn't my first rodeo on Tinder, but this was the strangest thing to happen to me. So towards the end of October, I met a guy named Dave on Tinder, and from the looks of it, he was an okay guy. He was funny and a gentleman, didn't ask for anything inappropriate. It seemed fine. We talked for about two weeks and set up a time to go on a date. We decided to meet in the city where he'd recently moved to, which was about 35 minutes away from my house. I got to the bar to wait for him and he was about 15 minutes late. He walked in and looked relatively similar to his pictures, which I was happy about. And then he opened his mouth to talk, and he had a very strange voice, like he was always on the verge of crying. It was very weird. He had some tattoos on his arms, including the all-seeing eye Illuminati symbol. Trying to break the tension, I jokingly said, Illuminati confirmed, tell me your secrets. He says, what the hell are you talking about? Don't say that kind of stuff in public. I just kind of laughed it off and he was being weird. He then said, you know that people who pry are people who die. I just looked at him and I genuinely didn't know how to respond. Fast forward about 20 minutes and a couple of my friends came to the bar at my urging. I moved to sit on the same side as him so my friends could sit on the same side of the booth. The minute I sit down, he puts his hand on my knee and squeezes. And not like the, oh, I'm interested way, but a hard fucking squeeze. I looked at him to stop 
and he leans over and whispers, You have lovely kneecaps. By the time my friends left, he had had seven beers. It was a Tuesday. As I go to close my tap, he stands behind me. It was noticeable he was at full mast. I very quickly signed my receipt and stepped away. As I'm getting ready to say goodbye, it starts raining. He then informs me that he walked to the bar from his house and asked for a ride home. Reluctantly, I agreed, and on this very short drive to his house, he informs me that it's not actually his house. He's living in his sister's basement. When I finally park in front of his house, he leans over to kiss me. I try to give him the cheek but he physically turned my head and puts his entire tongue in my mouth. I pulled away and this guy did it again. I finally managed to pull away and said, Get the fuck out of my car. He responds with, I am in love with you. I knew from the moment I saw your pictures. You have to come inside and meet my sister and her husband. I told him if he didn't get out of my car, I was calling the police. He started tearing up and got out of my car. When I was in high school, I lived in a really small town in Texas. It was a kind of place where everyone was either related to each other or hated each other. I had no family there, so yeah. But I did have a pretty blonde girlfriend and was pretty hated for that too. Nothing major, just petty harassment, occasional fights, but it had been escalating. So, that's why on Valentine's Day, my girlfriend and I decided to skip the school dance and just stay in and watch a movie at her house while her parents were out. It was just better to avoid trouble. We borrowed her dad's car, a little Honda hatchback, and we went to town. We stopped at the video store for a movie and went to the Dairy Queen for some ice cream, and then we headed home. Now, she lives in the complete boonies, out in the middle of the woods along a lonely road with no streetlights. We're chatting eating our blizzards when all of a sudden a car comes up behind us. No big deal. What was a very big deal was when the headlights flooded the interior of our car. I saw two hands on the back seat and a head coming from the hatchback part of the car. As soon as the lights hit, the head and hands retreated back down. A solid chill ran through the entire length of my body. I slowly reached down and pulled out my pocket knife. She saw me and asked what was wrong. Loudly I said, Nothing. I just have to stop at a friend's house real quick. She knew that was bullshit. I didn't have any friends. I pulled over at the next house that came up and jumped out of the car yelling at her to jump out too. She jumped out in total confusion. I flipped the driver's seat forward and lunged into the back seat in full maniac mode. He popped up like a jack-in-the-box with empty hands waving. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, yeah. Uh, what are you all up to tonight? It was some weird kid from our high school who we had never in our entire lives spoken to before. Ever. I said, What the holy fuck are you doing in our car? His reply was, I thought you guys were going to the dance and I was just hitching a ride. We sat there staring at him with our mouths wide open, wondering what to do. He tried to act real cool and obviously we were in the middle of nowhere, in some random person's driveway. So whatever he was planning was forgotten. We actually ended up driving him to the dance and dropping him off. The whole time he's telling us to come inside with him. Yeah, no. We dropped his ass off and noped out of there as soon as we could. As soon as he got out of the car, my girlfriend started crying and shaking. She was so freaked out. I have no idea what he was trying to do when the lights caught him crying out of the hatchback. I hated that high school. I've been working at this small bank for almost a year. It'll be a year in July. Ever since the beginning, this customer has been obsessed with me and it recently escalated. Up until February of this year, he's been mildly harmless, mainly just asking my co-workers if I'm single, or if I'm interested in him. Even after hearing I have a significant other, he did not let up. He would come in at least three to four times a week, just to withdraw money from his account. At this time, I also had a second job at an animal shelter. I stupidly told him this. 
One day, after asking if we had a certain dog, he then gave me his number to send him pictures of the dogs we had there, which prompted me to tell him that we had a website. He just brushed that off and left. Needless to say, I never sent him any pictures, but he did keep asking until I told him it was against our policy to do so. Pretty harmless at this point, right? Well, around January, he spots my manager in a Walmart. He stops her and asks. Even though she's engaged, I see a connection in her eyes, and I know she knows we have a connection. Should I stop pursuing her? My manager told him he should stop. Mind you, he's been told by my other co-workers that I was not interested and engaged multiple times at this point, so I'm thinking it's all done. But comes Valentine's Day, I get a single rose with a small note saying, Hope your day is great. Secret admirer. He called about twice that day to see if I received the rose with the note. He was told that I did not. Then a week later, he walks in and hands me an envelope with the words, Do not bend. He said it was an engagement present, which I politely declined, but he insisted. It was a signed picture of some 49er. I'm not a football fan. For the next couple of months, he's pretty quiet about things, but he was still asking when I wasn't around. He would circle the building, I'm assuming to look for my car. I now have to park in a parking lot two streets over. Everything was quiet up until about two weeks ago. He comes in to get money, and I unfortunately have to help him. When I go to hand him his money, he grasps my hand as I'm handing it to him, and just smiles and leaves. I don't say anything due to just being in shock. Then last Friday was the breaking point. Just not by this point, we already know what his handwriting looks like. I come back from lunch to a bouquet of flowers with a note sitting on my desk. It was a pretty long note. It was creepy to say the least. Yesterday he walks in and I was told by our HR department that I needed to tell him to stop. But when he came in, I just couldn't. I didn't want to make him mad because I watched too much Dateline and Criminal Minds, but my manager did and he just said it wasn't him. He then goes home to tell his father, who then proceeded to yell at my manager. Needless to say, I think this will be the last time I see or hear from him, because they said they would be closing their accounts. It turned out they didn't come to the branch, nor did they call us to have their accounts closed. In the past two days, we've been gathering statements from the rest of my co-workers about what he said. I haven't gone to the police about this yet, because I don't believe him to be a danger just yet, but also I don't have substantial evidence that it's him. Although the handwriting is his, I never saw him physically write the note. It would eventually come down to his word against mine. Our HR department isn't entirely helpful for anything either, but at least my manager and the rest of the staff have my back. I haven't gotten much sleep since Friday, and last night I had a pretty mild panic attack. I cannot help but put some blame on myself for this, but I know I've done nothing to provoke him. I just can't shake that feeling. My father had been dating this girl for a while, and things were going great. She met us a few times and got along great with my sister and I. Eventually, my father asked her to move in with us. She drove seven hours to move in and brought her two cats. Things were great for the first two months, until she couldn't find a job. They had agreed that she was to apply for jobs and have one secured for an interview before she moved in. She moved in on July 2nd. She didn't have a job until late January. I, being fresh out of high school with no experience in a job setting, was able to get a job before her. This caused my father to have to cover her car payments and insurance. This set us back financially, but we were okay. Then October came with the discovery of a full year's worth of text messages between her and a friend of hers named Jared, all taking place after my father and her were dating, and all while she was still living in her hometown. These messages were laced with him coming over and giving her nighttime lovings, and followed with inappropriate pictures. My father confronted her about it, and she denied it, saying that we just didn't understand her friendships. My father lets it go as they haven't messaged each other in weeks. Small arguments pop up, and she starts sneaking money out of my dad's wallet at night to go and buy cigarettes. 
This may only sound like a small amount, but it was a nightly occurrence. This set us back financially as well. These arguments mainly consist of her lying about something and not admitting it, or her doing something stupid and not apologizing. Things got worse as Christmas came. My father expressed that he didn't love her anymore, and he didn't have any feelings towards her and that she needed to work to fix a relationship if she wanted to continue. This meant really trying to get a job and not lying about stupid shit. She agreed she would. I advised him against giving her the option. I was tired of her shit and wanted her out. She started lying more and more and causing more problems. We believed she started taking some sort of drug as she would come back from a drive all shaky and spazzing out, spouting nothing but nonsense. She came after myself and a friend of mine during one of their arguments, to which my father responded, Pack your shit and get the fuck out. How dare you go after my kids, you bitch. Telling her to get out and leave was a regular occurrence in their fights, but she never took the hint. She was abusive emotionally to everyone in the household, and especially my father, reducing him to tears when he found out she'd been receiving $1,000 a month from her mother, which would have had her staying up to date on rent payments. We have no idea what she did with the money. No matter the situation, she would try to twist it so she would be the victim, even calling my father asking second opinions there party of the persecuting Martha. Nothing is ever her fault, and it's always a misunderstanding. Then she started smoking in the garage. The door from the garage into the house is right across from my bedroom door, which is always open because our cats like sleeping on my bed with me. I have asthma. I woke up coughing and smelling cigarettes multiple times in one night because of her. She drove recklessly with my little sister and I in the car before. I told my father what happened. When my father confronted her on it, she said I was over-exaggerating, that driving in the dark freaks her out, that my sister and I, in our, it's too early for this and I want to sleep and listen to my earbuds state, were stressing her out. A minor thing, but she endangered my sister and my own cats. We have two strictly indoor cats, and her two were outdoor cats until they moved here. Her cats have taught mine how to sneak out of the house when the front door isn't latched. She leaves the front door open constantly when she comes back in from smoking, and then my cats get out. We live right across the street from a huge lot of desert, and we hear coyotes every single night. She lets my cats get out at night. After she finally got a job, she did not want to contribute to her fair share of bills. My father asked her for half of her paychecks every two weeks. She claimed it should only be 25% because there are four people in the house. My sister and I are only there on the weekends as we go to school outside of town. We stay with other family during that time. She also apparently wasn't paying her car payments after she got her job, as she received a repossession notice which she hid from my father. Finally, after financially wrecking us, abusing my father emotionally and financially, endangering myself and my sister, doing drugs, taking money, stealing things from my room, endangering my cats and many other things. My father gave her two weeks to move out. She moved out yesterday, and all I have to say to her is, let's not meet again, because I will not be nice like I had to be before. Lots of hate, the daughter of the man you broke. I am a big fan of tea and cookies, and the convenience store near my house sells them. On the way back from other stuff we were doing, I ask my mom to stop there so I can buy some. I'm a regular at the store, and by that I mean I go there almost every day since 2017, and I had never seen this man before. I just walk past him, but he stops me and points to the entrance to the store, asking if that's the entrance. I tell him yes and keep walking towards it but he keeps walking besides me and says something in another language. I thought it was Romanian since I kind of recognized some words in that language, but he told me it was Bulgarian. At this point I'm already a bit creeped out by him, because I am generally scared of everyone, but in that moment, I just thought he needed help translating, so I was trying to calm myself down. As soon as we enter the store, he grabs my arm and pulls me closer to him. I'm just screaming inside of my head, but I keep calm. 
I power walk inside and try to get rid of him. And when he asks me a question about bread, I just kind of try to understand what he said since I'm still thinking he needs help. But at the same time, I'm scared. I just want to go back home. I try to lose him through the aisles of the store, but he keeps following me. I was scared of asking people for help because, like I said, I'm generally scared of everyone. He then grabs me and starts touching my face, saying, Beautiful. Very beautiful. Young. All in Italian. And then he tries to take off my mask. I just start running for my life at that point. I get my cookies and go home. I told my mom about it and she said I should have told her earlier so we could have confronted him. But honestly, I just wanted to go home. Tomorrow I'm bringing something with me to make me feel more secure. I'll go back there to tell whoever works there to keep an eye out for this guy since I don't want this to happen to anyone else. You may think some of the things I did were dumb, and I completely agree with you, but I was very scared and I barely even look at strangers. This was a completely new experience to me. Thanks for checking the video out, I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and comment, and subscribe too if you haven't. I want to say a quick thanks to my YouTube members and patrons for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to Carol, Estara Rain, Blazed Goddess, Monique, Kel, Monica Lavalais, Spider's Web, Emma, Sean Gorman, Misanthropia, Fluby, Ryan, Brenda, Rudy, Rochelle, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire 05, Shan, Jody, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, James Gogano, Gemma Allen, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. If you guys fancy checking out my YouTube memberships, Patreon, Twitter, or Reddit, all my links are in the description. Thanks again for checking the video out, guys. I hope you've had a great day. I'll be doing another premiere and chat on the 17th. I'm celebrating one year of the channel. So if you could make it, that'd mean a lot. Anyway guys, I'll see you on the next one.